I'm Stefan Bauman. I would like to invite you on a special journey. A journey of exploration. To discover the splendor. To feel the excitement. And to experience the wonders of painting outdoors. In one of America's most stunning locations, I invite you to come to the Grandview Ranch and see for yourself what a weekend can do to transform your art. Everything you need to know is on our website, www.stephanbauman.com. Yeah, so, so, you know, I can remember one of my fondest memories of, of working in Yosemite was to actually sit in the middle of a field and have a canvas in my lap, a little board, one of my masonite boards that I covered with primer. And this primer I, I used, now this goes back 25, 30 years ago and it hasn't peeled since. For those people who say it's not traditional or it won't last, it's like it's still hanging up on my wall. But so I sat with this little eight by ten in my lap, and I sketched a tree, and I sketched it with painting. Now, painting is drawing with paint. It's not drawing and then separate from painting. And so some people, when they get a brush in their hands, they just go hog wild and they think, "Well, I'm painting. Isn't that fun?" It's like Rob Ross, it's like, oh, happy little trees and stuff. But there are forms and structures to every tree. And when I sat down in front of that oak tree in Yosemite, I sat down with the intention that I was going to draw what I saw. And that's one of the biggest problems with people who paint trees, is that they just assume that it's a shape. And a lot of times when you're in my classes, We'll, we'll talk about doing trees, and I say, well, you need some bird holes in them. And they look at me like, bird holes? And I go, yeah, otherwise you'll have to paint a bunch of dead birds around the base. <laughs> they need things to fly through, so you need some blue sky holes. And when you're painting them in the landscape, those sky holes are a half a shade to a shade darker than the sky that's around it. So even when you're putting the holes in the trees, they need to be darker, and it has to do with how the, the shadow of the limbs and the concentrated light, um, I know it's very complicated, but the thing is those holes are a different value than the holes on the outside. So there's a lot of interesting things to think about when you're painting trees, along with the different kinds of stems and trunks that make up the tree, the form, and even like how branches attach themselves to a tree. So when we look at a tree, we're actually looking at a very, very complicated drawing. Most painters take that for granted. And if you could go to an art show, and it's like almost everybody has a simplistic painting of a tree. And yet, they're very, very complicated. And so the only way you learn how to do a tree is to sit and do a, a, a sketch like this which is, and like you said, you just basically sat in front of the tree and you drew it, and if it wasn't right, you changed it. And I think the issue with trees and why people don't do them very well is because they figure, oh well, nobody's gonna notice or it doesn't really matter. And if this branch grows this way and this branch grows that way, who's gonna know, right? But when you look at like uh, Shishkin, you know, when you look at Shishkin's paintings, and you look at his forest scenes, you go, my God, it's like looking at a photograph. It's even better than a photograph. Remember when we discovered Shishkin? An amazing Russian painter. But when you look at his trees, they're like looking at trees. And it's because the, he doesn't ha adopt a certain brush stroke or a certain look. And I think that that's a big problem with people who do trees. They watch Rob Ross there paint happy little trees with his little fan brush. <laughs> 
And when I start teaching trees, they're like, oh, wait a minute, I've got to find my fan brush. And I'm like, who told you trees were made with fan brushes? Well, I paint with fan brush all the time. Well, yeah. That's okay. You can paint with fan brushes, but not all trees are made with a fan brush. And so then they wonder why it kind of looks like a cookie cutter. And the thing is, yeah, you can use a fan brush to make trees, but most people make them incorrect because they'll hit the fan brush straight on. And the, the way that you work with a fan brush is to use the side of the fan brush back and forth. And then after you go for a bit, you flip it the other direction because the hairs going in each direction are different. And you try to get a lot of variety. There's nothing in a tree that's duplicated once. Everything that's in a tree is completely different. Every branch is different. Every form is different. And if you go about looking for something that is similar throughout, you're probably going to miss the overall concept or the overall personality of that tree. So you kind of have to look at each tree as being a separate portrait. In order to think of it that way, you've got to sit in front of it and ask yourself, how does that branch hit the trunk? How do the little branches hit the branches? How does the tree grow? How do the seasons grow? How does that all play in, into account? And so it's a study of trees. And so I find with a lot of trees that I take the like go stop, go stop method, which means that uh, a branch will go out from a tree to a certain point and it's the end of the season. And it dies off and goes into winter and then spring comes again and then it will jot out again. And when it jots out again, it has another direction. So what a lot of artists would do is simplify that form but what you want to do is kind of make a line and then stop, make a line and then stop, make a line and then stop. And that's where you can kind of get season after season after season. So that's a really good kind of concept to think about the smaller brushes, branches out there. The bigger branches, how do the smaller branches attach to that? And one of the biggest mistakes that artists make, especially beginning artists, is that every branch feels like it's growing away from each other. So you'll end up with a branch that sticks out, and then you'll think, wow, it'd be good to do some smaller branches. And so the artist will start doing these smaller branches, and they kind of come out like hands. None of them cross each other or anything. They just like come out like these sticks out of the main form. And then when there's a branch here, they'll actually like mold this branch not to go over this branch. And so you end up with these weird formations of, of, of uh, shapes that don't cross each other because branches, you know, trees are like three-dimensional. To, to learn how branches organically grow behind and in front of each other is something you have to observe. Sitting down and painting uh, a tree and observing those little things will make you a little bit better. Another thing about branches is that as they jut out um, from, a, from a main limb, or from a trunk, they'll jut out like this and they'll have light along here. But as the branch turns this way, it turns away from the light. And a lot of artists will paint the branch all the same color. So anything that's horizontal will actually be a different color than anything that's vertical. And then if it's diagonal, it may actually be reflecting the color of the sky. And if you see a tree that's reflecting the color of the sky up in the sky area, that branch may even disappear slightly. So there's a lot to think about. As branches come up, and we were, did Dee's painting today, as branches came out of the ground and came up above the forest, she had the bright light behind it. And as branches come in front of the bright light, they silhouette, they get darker. So if you want to create really strong lighting effects in your sky, when the branches go in front of the sky, they get darker. So you've got to pay attention to that, too. So it's not only just shape, form, you know, um, just main structure. How does a branch come into a trunk? You know, if I ask somebody, OK, paint me an oak tree, they're just kind of like, but how does a branch attach itself to the trunk itself? And how do you make that three-dimensional? How do you make the big question is, is how do you make branches that come out at you? That's very difficult. The, think about how, how do you do that? How do you make a branch come out of a tree at you? Because when you think about trees, they're not just like this. 
They actually have branches that go this way. How do you do that? And how do you make them look like they come at you and then twist? Or even go back? And you've got to, th it's light and shadows, yes, but there's also perspective. Because as the tree comes at you, if you follow perspective, as things get closer to you, they get bigger. And if you have a trunk that's coming at you, it's supposedly getting bigger. How do you know the proportion of that? It's cool to go things in real It's awesome. The best thing you can do is what Christian did, is to sit your butt in a meadow, put a canvas in your lap, and have a conversation with a tree. What, what are you? Another thing that people don't get with trees, one of the biggest mistakes I see with trees is that they forget their relationship to where they are in a tree. And a lot of people will put trees in last or think they're not important or they're just like wallpaper in a, in a, in a scenery. It's just something that you just put in there. But when you think about our relationship to a tree, when we're looking at a tree at our eye level, and that's the horizon, and the horizon's really a crucial place to be in a painting. When you're looking across and you're seeing a horizon line in, in, in a forest, the branches that are at that point are coming at you, and you're actually seeing the branches both more from the side of them. So if you have a round object, you're kind of like looking at them. So it's just like that. But if the branches are lower, you're actually looking on top of the branches. So those branches that you're painting that are below your horizon line, those actually you're looking down on. And so those branches, you're not seeing the side, you're seeing the tops. And what really becomes important is because trees are tall. And so as the tree gets taller and taller, you're seeing more of the underneath part of the branch. And most people are painting branches like this all the way up, and they wonder why their paintings look like ladders. You know, so um, you're not seeing them directly. So every one of those limbs, as it gets further up, the more you see underneath them. So higher limbs are painted this way, these are painted straight on, and then these are painted. So you just never think about that when you're thinking about trees. We're trying to teach you to observe. So, Christian sits down and he starts painting. And he said something very interesting. He said, he drew it, and tell me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to misquote you. But you drew it, and if it wasn't right, you wiped it off and you redrew it, kind of reworking it as you went to make sure it was correct. So, yeah, so like this branch, you know, like this branch here, you can see it goes away from you. If this isn't drawn correctly, then it's going to mess up the, the branch behind it or the branch under it. So every aspect of the tree is important. These openings in here between the trees are important too because those will actually give you the scales and the form of the shape they make. And a tree like this, well, it's probably an oak tree, but a tree like this, actually the negative shapes, what we call the bird holes, are different than if it was a eucalyptus or a eucalyptus tree. A eucalyptus tree has a different bird hole. And so a lot of times when you're painting eucalyptus trees, you actually have a lot of vertical lines in, in the bird holes to give the feeling that it's drooping and weeping. The outside of the trees make a lot. And when you look at a forest, like if you come up to the workshop, which you are now, but when you come to a forest, there's a hundred trees, different kinds of trees. I think we have at least eight to 10 different kinds of trees just on our 10 acres. I'm amazed at the variety of trees that we have. And that doesn't even include the oak trees and the dogwood. I'm just talking about pine trees. You guys are going to be doing a lot of trees. So the best exercise that you can do is to sit down in front of a tree and just have an afternoon with it. And then when you're through with that, it's just something you put up in your studio. Now, is this a painting that you necessarily are going to sell? Probably so if it's done well. These studies are really incredible and they're phenomenal. And I know that a lot of times people just think, oh, God, would you just give us some homework of something that's pretty? You know? But what my goal is to have you do is to learn how to see, paint what you see. And don't take anything for granted. I give you a really weird assignment today because I know some of you have seen 
these light bulbs, but how are they actually made? How are they put together? What do they look like? Is it one swirly dude or is there two? And how do they twist together? The, so those of you who did the homework assignment can answer that question now because you all of a sudden got an insight of what modern light bulbs look like. But why do I have you do those homework assignments? Why do I have you paint one of these new electric light bulbs? What artisticness does that have to offer? All it is is observations. Because you've got a tube, you've got lights and shadows, it, they, it goes away from you, it comes from you, very similar like branches. And so if you learn to kind of key, and there's a lot of negative shape, in fact, if you don't pay, to negative shape, pay attention to negative shape in doing one of the light bulb paintings, you're not gonna probably do the same thing when you're doing a tree. And I know this is really basic 101 on doing trees, but I guarantee you, most of you haven't even thought about that when you think about putting trees in your painting. Did you think about that today? Do you want to think about it? Yeah. When, you, when you're drawing your trees, are you thinking about looking underneath them and below them? No. No, not exactly. Do you think about how are you going to twist a branch in front of you? Well, Yeah, so your biggest, your biggest problem when you're doing trees is that you need to think about it's all lights and shadows, like you said. And if you're going to do a tree that's coming at you, you have light here, shadow here, light here, shadow here. And literally, it's how you work those lights and shadows in some of its form. Yeah. So, no, if, if, if a tree is lit, it's lighter. But if you have illuminated light area, and you're going to put something in front of it that's round and narrow and not so big, that area is usually darker. And if you take a look at this, if, if I could probably do it right here, but if you take a look at my hand here, you can see everything, fine. But as I put my hand in front of that, not light it, um, that would actually appear darker. And if the more illuminated light you have, you could just hold your hand up and hold it up against a, a bright area the light from behind actually causes that object to, to go into shadow. So um, Dee had a painting where there was a lot of backlighting. The sky was very luminous. And she purposely did that because she was trying to get the center focal point there. And so as the tree came out of the ground and kind of came across the other trees and in front of the mountain, you could pretty much see the color of the tree itself. But as it came up in front of the, the sky, which had all that light, that had all that light. I didn't bore him, he's got to go to it. <laughs> but as that light kind of hits him like that and it gets dark, it will get dark. And so this part of the tree here, you can actually see the detail and stuff, but where you get up into where the branches are, you won't see the detail so much anymore. And this becomes almost like a silhouette in dark. So it's just what happens. And then as those lines get smaller and smaller, a lot of them will actually disappear because the background light is so intense. So the more intense you have, you have kind of a feeling of, of the background kind of actually dwarfing the branches themselves. So it's really kind of complicated. And the only way you're going to learn how to do this is to, to sit and study them. And the only way you're going to get to sit and study them is to choose a tree and then copy it. Like all of, we, all of us should come out here and just do a study like this. Just a real simple study of a tree for our studios. And they are valuable. People love them because they can relate to them. Paintings don't have to be complicated. And then when you finish one, you do another one. And then you do another one. Now, why are you doing that? It's just for your knowledge in your head. It's just to learn how trees look, how they attach. Don't take it for granted. Shishkin's paintings are fabulous because he understand how trees grew and he could draw a force and you totally believed it. You, I can tell by the way you did this that you work from life. It has a life quality. And when you're painting from life, there is a difference. And students of, of mine, some of which um, we know. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names. 
Um, they insist on taking a picture, it was even a still life that they set up. And they insist on painting from the photograph because they think it's the same. And it's not. To paint a tree from a photograph, you're not going to get the same quality. And you, Joan, have some magnificent trees on your house. You could, you could really do this well. Um, Chris had a painting of a tree where the whole painting was just mainly just this tree on a hillside. And I said, what about sticking some bird holes in there, you know, to go? And I was quickly informed that this particular tree does not have bird holes. <laughs> they grow solid. And I said, I looked at her and she goes, no, believe me, there is no bird holes in these trees. And I go, okay, because there are trees I've never drawn before. And she may be correct. When you're up on Mount Shasta, as you're driving up towards uh, um, the peak there, there is some trees that look like they were formed. They look like they are cones, right? You've seen those. They're just solid cones, perfect. And you wonder, and they're only in one area of that, of that area. They're only in one area, but they're completely. And although they're awesome to drive by and you go, what kind of trees are those? Yeah, everybody catches them it's because it's like somebody went in and, and purposely made Christmas trees out of them. But they're gigantic, they're huge, and these one, they grow that way. But I would never suggest to put that in a painting. And I think a lot of times people just simplify trees because they kind of look at them as a wallpaper or a placeholder. But I think the artist, when you go out playing or painting, I think the paintings look a little more natural because you're not just simplifying. You're actually trying to recreate what's in front of you. And then you run into this. But the problem is, as your brush is going over trying to draw this, and if you haven't really spent some time on this, you simplify that. And trees are not simple. They're very complicated. And when I judge a sh an art show, I can pretty much tell if somebody's a professional or not by just how they do branches on trees, let alone trees themselves. So it really takes, it's really worthwhile to spend some time, spending some time like Christian did, to study them. You don't have to finish this because everything you need to know about this tree you did. And I would highly say at this point, you probably could finish it at home from a photograph because you really have a nice three-dimensional quality, but it would be awesome if you could go out there and finish it on location at the same time of day, if you can. Um, but everything you really needed to learn about how a tree works is already on here. So you can leave this video down. If you like to take your painting to the next level, regardless at whatever level you are, please feel free to contact me at 415-606-9074. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, 